I wanted to um, really try to, to analyze a few of the strategies that I, I have tried to identify in the way that he works and sort of try and um, look at, not necessarily a, a formula for Roman Ombek's work, but the way in which he tends to um, establish certain criteria and, and, and repeat certain structures which themselves together accumulatively, I think, give you a, a very good idea of of uh, what really the, the, the sort of sense, what the purpose of his work is, really. Um, on the one hand, I'll probably talk a bit about his work's relationship to sight, and maybe um, afterwards too, I, I won't talk specifically about the works in this exhibition, one of them, but, but not the others, but perhaps afterwards it'd be interesting to talk about this exhibition in relationship to this idea of sight in his work as well, sight, placement, locality. Please tell me if I'm speaking too fast or like that. Um, and the other aspect that I'm, I've been very interested in with his work is the way in which he, he uses historical, um, historical works, 60s and 70s, both from the West and from the East, his own sort of environment in, uh, uh, in Slovakia, but also in, in sort of broader Eastern Bloc countries, um, and parallel developments in the, in the West in conceptual and minimal work. And the way in which you see that he, he uses these structures, these, these sort of trajectories of art history in his own practice. So I'm going to mix a bit of, of reading, which I don't normally like to do, but I am going to do it tonight, and I'll break away and talk about the images as well as we, we go forward. Um, this is partly based, I have to say, on, and, and largely based on an essay that I wrote for the catalogue that will come out in yeah. June, I believe. You can buy it then. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, the historical development of site-specific and conceptual art of the 60s and 70s in the West has been well documented and researched, the parallel developments in the East have either been largely overlooked or viewed really through the dominant lens of the West. It generally relegates these movements to subheadings in art history. We don't have a, it's beginning to emerge a greater history of Eastern European art, but by and large it is still viewed through uh, uh, the, the lens of a, a conceptual movement in, in the West, the, the sort of um, movement that what happened in the East is generally seen as and sometimes derivative or influenced by and so forth. It's never um, given the, the sort of entitlement of its own um, development. Um, Roman Ondek's work, well, in some sense, expanding the critical understanding of what conceptual art and issues of site specificity might or could be, also suggests an entertainingly acute analysis of the analogous developments in East and West paralleling these frequently. Um, he minds the significance of the dual connotations of these separate but related lineages. As a result of the artist's engagement with the past, um, I often find a, a feeling of deja vu accompanies his work. It's almost as if you, you feel that you might have seen this piece or this work, and perhaps another artist made it 30 years before, some uh, sort of related qualities in it that re remind you quite explicitly, and, and obviously intentionally, of uh, earlier artworks by other artists. Um, but although it's familiar in its strategies, it's very much of its own time, um, and his work can give the impression almost of an off-kilter reading of conceptual art. I sometimes think that his work almost looks as if he, he's an artist who uh, has consumed um, catalogues from the past of art magazines and so forth, read images, but without the information um, that, that would be behind the work. What was the idea, what was the process behind a, a particular conceptual piece or performance perhaps from the 60s or 70s. It's this very literal reading. Um, but it, of course, it's an act on Ondek's part that is totally intentional. Um, this, this sort of idea of the, the innocence, perhaps, of, of reading these earlier works. Um, I think what it, it masks, in fact, a very effective ploy to engage the public in ideas that can otherwise be quite complex and off-putting, perhaps. Um, and while the effect of it, the, the strategy is very compelling, um, what I find particularly compelling is the ideas that I think informed it, which go back to this, um, this identification that I think he, he makes in his work of the separate processes of development of Eastern and Western conceptual and, and perhaps also minimal work. Um, his work is highly influenced by fellow Slovak artist Julius Koller, and I have to apologize, I should have brought images of, of Julius Koller's work, I don't know how familiar you might be with him an artist who uh, was working in Slovakia in the 60s and 70s, and who in fact Roman Ondak has curated an exhibition of his work in Cologne not so long ago. Um, he was an artist who worked very much in a uh, conceptual but also performance-based um, manner. Uh, it would be a whole other lecture to, to do about his work, so I won't get deviated here, but fascinating artist. 
Um, but I would say that he's equally influenced by a, a sort of wider group of artists developed, whose work emerged in Eastern Europe in, in very different climates, uh, climates and contexts. Yuri Kovanda, perhaps, in Czechoslovakia, and Edward Kaczynski in Poland, um, two artists of quite different generations, but all of whom had a practice that in many respects was involved with the idea of developing um, conceptual work outside of the realm of the gallery. And there were many reasons for this, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, Andek's work really calls into question the notion of any singular Western art history. And at the same time, well, at the same time as the avant-garde of the West were questioning the object of art, um, Julius Koller, Yuri Kabanda, Edward Kuczynski, and many others in the East were formulating a practice that similarly engaged with non-objective and context-specific, albeit practices with albeit different intentions. Um, the lack of public spaces for exhibiting, um, which resulted in the production of, of work in private or, or intimate spaces, often in the studio or in um, houses that, that uh, were sort of collectively shared by artists in uh, the Eastern Bloc. Um, the non-existence of a uh, or, or, or drastically underdeveloped form of an art market, as well as the desire and in some cases the necessity to operate outside of any institutionally designated art system, were all factors in, in this emergence of a conceptually based and, and non-objective form of, of uh, art making in the East in the 60s. Um, the permanent and ephemeral site-specific works that were produced in artist studios, collective spaces, or in the public arena in the Eastern Bloc necessarily had quite different structural and conceptual underpinnings to those that emerged in the West, despite numerous similarities in terms of form and, and execution. Ondek's work, I think, utilizes this history of parallel developments in parallel times, the, the, the notion really that these two lineages could be emerging with, with superficial or, or formal similarities and yet have quite different underlying um, reasons for their emergence. Um, and his work alerts us to both past and present worlds, making apparent the significance of this dualism within a broader context, extracting this idea of, of the ability of these two worlds to emerge at the same time, in, at the same, in different spaces and yet with the same ideas, um, and how that, that sort of notion of this dualism could in fact relate to many other things in, in life and society, beyond art making perhaps. Um, through the subtle and often disarmingly process of the process of relocating, representing, or duplicating site or event, Ondek mines the notion of contextual discrepancy for the rich political and aesthetic questions it raises. Some of Ondek's works, as I said, um, appear to be, at least from one perspective, uh, almost a spoof of, of Western phenomenological readings of site in the early conceptual works um, or site-specific pieces of artists like Richard Serra. Um, I'm going to show you here two pieces or two installations. One is called Remind Me Again, which you can see here, and another work called I Remember This. Um, I have to apologize for my images, they're not great, but I'll, I'll explain what you're looking at. Um, for both of these works, this is another image of Remind Me Again, and this is I Remember This. First details of the to begin. Um, both works consisted of scaled down models of the spaces in which um, on deck had been invited to, to exhibit. So what you're looking at is a, a, a smaller version of the room in which the piece is um, exhibited. I hope that's clear. Um, but what he did is he placed inside these model spaces, which are obviously not tiny, as you can tell from the scale here. It's just a, a, a kind of reduction in scale. Um, he placed the, the um, actual size electrical sockets, ventilation covers, alarm sensors, emergency exits, um, all, all of these kind of details of the architecture inside the model itself. So perhaps you can see um, on the wall there that the, even the, the kind of residue of where it was taken from, one of these wall panels that's exhibited inside the model. It, it's hard to read the details, I'm afraid. But basically you have this sort of contrast of real size um, exit signs, for instance, up here, situated inside this, this sort of model gallery space. Um, Focusing on these loki of, of minimalist ire, um, the fixtures and fittings of, of the gallery, Ondek at once seems to point humorously to the absurdity of these architectural imperfections in the white cube. And his titles, uh, Remind Me Again, or um, I Remember This, um, sorry, these titles seem to sort of imply that it was these details that stood out more than anything else in the space. You know, he walked through the gallery having been invited to exhibit there, and all he could really remember was the 
you know, the horrible green exit signs and the and, you know, misplaced electrical sockets. And um, I'll just walk through the. You can probably see a little bit better there what he's done. There you see the. You can quite clearly see where he's taken off the um, sockets from above the doorway. So while simultaneously referencing the carefully nuanced spatial concerns of artists such as Sarah, with particular emphasis on the disorienting shift in scale from actual space with actual size details to a model with outsized fittings. A similarly subtle performance was enacted for, it, whoop, is that the way it was? I always think his titles are incredibly, themselves are incredibly provocative. Um, this is a work from 98, so I didn't, there's two other pieces that you saw were also from 1998. Um, in this work, the artist cut a section from the gallery's false wall, which you can see on the, the left-hand side, revealing the radiator and original wall su surface behind it. He then constructed a bench from the extracted materials, which was the only object in the exhibition space, aside from an opening the window, which you can see here, into which a birdhouse had been placed, and the entrance to which was perplexingly on the inside of the gallery, rather than the outside. Um, this Gordon Matter Clark-like cutting of the the wall was recycled into a minimalist cubic sculpture um, sorry, please, please, that also operated as a, a fairly typical looking gallery bench. On deck's process set in place a cycle of knowing and yet utterly deflating gestures that quietly undermined the pretensions of radicality in much site-specific work, while at once opening up the potential of such operations to a much broader understanding. The accepted norms of gallery or museum architecture, the, the standard benches and the, the way in which we tend to hide every element on the wall that's, that doesn't fit the, the sort of white cube aesthetic, um, in particular were, were disassembled in such a way that their artifice became almost um, absurdly pronounced. So what, he, what he's done here, as you can see, is, is basically remove the wall and reveal what was the original kind of undulation of the wall, the radiator, and the, the kind of imperfect um, space behind it, and then make this uh, sort of typical gallery bench out of it. And there's the birdhouse, and from outside, impossible for any bird to enter. Other works have explored this process of relocation or duplication in order to make evident the otherwise accepted customs of site. For example, resting corner, which you can see here. I think I just have the one image. Here and uh, for, well, for which the artist placed the sofa and shelving unit, the only things that he placed in the space, which was otherwise kept empty. And museum storage, which I remember, this is it seen from behind. <coughs> for which Ondek built a simple plasterboard-like construction. Items such as a water cooler, coffee machine were placed on top of it, and various artworks, objects, installation materials, and odds and ends from the staff offices were stored inside, which is what you can see here. Resting corner, by its misuse of the gallery as a seating area, made the theatrically unwelcoming nature of the typical gallery space, in contrast to the adjacent furnished offices, abjectly evident, while simultaneously turning the space itself, which had an unusually rich history of uh, different surfaces and flooring, as you can see here, it's sort of almost like a sculpture in itself, um, so sort of turning the space into a sculpture, or perhaps if you came in and saw somebody sitting on the couch, they themselves became the sort of kinetic sculpture for you to, to observe in the space. Similarly revealing the vastly different aesthetics of the gallery space versus the behind the scenes quarters of the institution, museum storage, um, and this work is from 1999, performs something like an anthropological investigation of the social and cultural artifacts of this industry. From the classic gallery attendant's chair, which you can see there, and the cliché office water cooler to the more specifically museological art storage and, and curatorial ephemera, in, inside there were not only artworks but things taken from the desks of the curator's notes, postcards, um, personal effects and so on. Um, Ondek placed his findings on display, separating them inside and outside of the box, or inside and on top of the box, um, by some sort of classification of non-art and art. Inside the box were the, the art-related items, and on top of the box were non-art um, materials. 
Contained within the gathered materials is a brilliant but also quite endearing expose of the systems and structures of the museum, almost like a sort of upstairs and downstairs or front of house and behind the scenes. And this, this kind of theatrical um, or, or stage mechanism is something you see a lot in, in uh, Ondike's work, both in the titles and the way he develops it, the, the concepts. Um, but what sets Ondike's work apart from the critical investigations of site or, or institution, really, of, of artists such as Daniel Buren and Hans Hacke, is the perspective from which he constructs this analysis. While undoubtedly containing an acutely critical outlook, Ondek performs his examinations not from the position of an art world insider, but by articulating his work from the perspective of an interloper, someone potentially unaware of the gamesmanship of the last few decades of artistic production, or perhaps the sort of history of conceptual art, but entirely capable of understanding many of the pronouncements that such critical work aspires to at once exposing the artificiality or, or the artificiality or acquired customs of the art world, Ondek's work is placed firmly in the context of daily life and events, juxtaposing itself with the rules or order of the everyday, not only to deconstruct and to satirize, but also to reveal connectedness to other modes of life and work. So here in museum storage, you have a sense that the, the sort of activity of the guards or, or the people who work in the museum as non-art professionals a, a parallel somehow with the, the sort of artifacts that relate to the museum um, or the curatorial activity, let's say. Um, but there's no sense in which there's, that the hierarchy is somehow deflated. It, Ondek's approach to it is very much as, uh, a, a, as I said, a sort of anthropological investigation that looks at both with, with equal interest in order to evaluate what this, this sort of structure is. The performing a process or action that is often approximate to a historically recognizable artistic gesture or milieu, Ondike's work differs fundamentally from what it may resemble by occupying its position in the guise of one foreign to the art context, in such a way the non-art specific and potentially more far-reaching concerns of his work are allowed to become apparent. The significance of Ondike's work by no means ends with the, the revelation that the art world is a, a system constructed out of codes and accumulated from actions which would hardly be new news, um, but rather opens up the import of the art world and its language to a broader understanding of its um, receptivity to parallel societal, historical, and political events and structures. What, after all, would be the historical rationale, and what does it mean to construct a white cube masking the imperfections of an existing or older structure? Or how? For example, does the categorization of employees and artifacts in the museum parallel structures in daily life? Ondek's work enables us to gain access not to one other perspective, but to the potential for a multiplicity of, of understandings. This idea of a uh, sort of non-art perspective in his work, or that he embodies in, in his own uh, approach to art making, is uh, made... Oops, is made perhaps particularly apparent in his use of non-art practitioners in his work, which he's done quite frequently. Um, Ondak has requested the assistance of friends and family in the realization of work for numerous exhibitions. Um, for this work, Storyboard, which is from 2000, and I'll flip through this, an untitled empty gallery, also from 2000, uh, for example, I'll go to the beginning. Um, Ondek had invited friends and family to draw, according to his description, verbal description, pictures of the empty gallery space in which he was to show. The resulting drawings were the only thing he exhibited in the, the show that he'd been invited for. So he went to see the space, did his site visit, went back to his friends and family, described the site to them, had them draw what it was that he had described, and then exhibited these drawings. Um, the same process for, for both works. So I'll, I'll just so these are all individual drawings by different individuals. The storyboard, an untitled empty gallery. The potential reading of these works are as many as the author's voices, and it's made evident in the different styles and understandings of the described space. You can see, obviously, um, with the different works, you know, certain features that are repeated here, I mean, an amazing sort of spatial discrepancy between this extraordinary ladder that appears in two but is completely absent in another, and yet there's a sort of strange door going off. You just, 
I mean, the way in which people read space according to a description and then sort of try and visualize that is incredible. I, mean, I find it also an amazing parallel, really, for the process of artistic um, understanding, that, that sort of the, the transference of image into um, concept or, and back and forth is sort of from word to image to concept, and that you often see in his work this kind of misreading, really, that he allows to happen, which really relates back to this idea that I was saying at the beginning, where you almost have the sense that his own work is a misreading of the reading of images of uh, past historical works, a sort of deliberate misreading of what happens in, in that space between um, a, a certain amount of knowledge and an image. I hope that makes sense. Um, find my face. Uh, so the, the sort of multiple authors' voices that you see in the work and uh, the, the various styles give you an idea of the, the sort of multiple notions of, of what a space could be. Um, on the one hand, the works again perform a subtle and yet deft critique of a phenomenological understanding of site specificity. Because after all, uh, what, what can this mean? What, what, what can the site-specific mean, given that site itself suggests so many different things to so many different people? And on the other, and on the other they suggest the multiplicity of perspectives evident in just one eye, or one individual, while simultaneously affirming the total negation of the need for the authenticity of the artist's hand. Um, the work storyboard, of what, to go back to this idea of, of theatre and staging again, of course the idea of a storyboard for an exhibition, I mean the, the drawings are presented and titled storyboard, again suggesting another layer of, of, um, of the, the sort of theatrical or the staging within the process, somehow again removing it from the idea of actually making an exhibition, it's a storyboard for an exhibition. I mean, it sort of provokes a different understanding of what the, how one actually um, uh, reads the work first. On deck continued to explore this rich terrain and the work's common trip, tonight is common trip, and uh, Futuropolis, which I'll show you now, I'll flip through to, there's Futuropolis. Um, for the former he asked, for, for common trip, he asked friends and family to make representations either two or three dimensional of the most memorable places he had visited, uh, Roman Ondek had visited, according to his description. And for the latter, he had the same people, um, it's a hundred people, the same hundred people draw their vision of, the fu of a future megalopolis. Um, these works were six years apart, so Common Trip was made in 2000, and uh, Futuropolis in 2006. Common Trip formed an extraordinary landscape of various well and, and lesser known sites, monuments and buildings, as imagined by people who had never seen them. So if we go through, you can begin to recognize some of the buildings that Ondek might have been describing to people or, or sites. Um, the work poignantly calls into question the cliche of the global traveler, alluding to the fact that the majority is still unable, though perhaps also unwilling, to leave their local environment. The grandeur of certain not to be missed monuments was delightfully dashed by the simplified representation through imaginative projection. Futuropolis, on the other hand, as Roman himself, not here today, but there is an the image, um, was filled with strangely passe notions of the future. The numerous visions of pod-like apartments, flying vehicles, and tubular connections between buildings revealed how much we still cling to the surprisingly anachronistic media-fueled visions of a future world. Shown for the first time in Sao Paulo, in the Biennale, which is where I first saw it, um, the piece drew attention to Sao Paulo, the, the, the megalopolis of Sao Paulo's own expansive realization of 21st century um, urbanism, which turns out not at all to be um, shiny sky trains or, or even Oscar Niemeyer's utopian city, but instead a, a graffiti-covered concrete urban sprawl. So this work seen in Sao Paulo had a, a sort of very strong sense of its appropriateness for that location. It sort of, it, amazing way in which we cling on to some notion of, of what the future may look like when in fact the, the future was actually all around us there and it certainly didn't look anything like that. In a further twist on this use of others to execute his work, Ondek once had the curator of an exhibition invite ten individuals to draw himself, the artist, according to the curator's description. So they hadn't met Roman, um, the curator described Roman um, to these ten people, and they had to draw him according to that description. This is a work from 2004. 
world, I'm just acting in it. And again, back to this idea of staging and, and theatrics, I'm, I'm just acting in it. Um, not, only, what not only raises the same issues with regard to space and sight, but directly questions the author's role. Ondak at once suggests that he is performing the role of artist, just one among the many elements in the art world structure, he seems to point out, and interrogates the, the, the relationship or hierarchy between author and reader, or artist and viewer. How they were installed. In addition to a humorous play on past conceptual work and an opening up of the critical potential of such work, Ondak has arguably extended our understanding of contemporary art's relationship to sight. One of the artist's best known works, Good Feelings in Good Times, which you can see here as it was installed in Cologne, um, succinctly addresses the manner in which Ondak's work manifests sight precisely from the position of a removed or outsider perspective, this idea of being a, a sort of non-art participant that he um, employs in his work. For its first realization, the performance consisted of a queue outside the normally quiet Kölnische Kunstverein, where the line in front of the entrance would form and disappear at intervals throughout the day. So it wasn't there permanently, it would, it would be there and then disappear and then appear again. Apparently eager, eagerly waiting to enter the museum and gain access to the exhibition, suggesting a populism rarely associated with contemporary art. The cube also alluded to the construction of value through the vis visual evidence of supply and demand. A clearly coded form of social gathering, the cube has vastly different connotations according to its location, and the work subtly plays with cultural specificity, historical memory, and behavioral dis difference. Ondak's own associations from Slovakia um, with the meaning of the queue were informed by his, uh, the long lines that he witnessed growing up as a, uh, a child and, and young adult in, uh, well, now in Bratislava, in Slovakia. Um, Slovak shops during the communist era when passers-by were lured by the, the promise of scarce goods would eagerly await, unaware of what it was they were waiting for at all, just see a line and you would join it in the hope that there was something good, a reward at the end. Um, a repeat performance of the work in London at the Freeze Art Fair, and I'm afraid I don't have images of this, um, drew attention to the uniquely British custom of patient waiting. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but in Britain we love to queue. Um, other locations, can e one can easily imagine, will raise yet more associations and critical assessments of the given context. Of course, at the, the fair, the idea of people queuing at a fair uh, the, uh, perhaps the, the freeze out fair is an uh, exceptional circumstance, but it, it's become a very um, sort of fashionable event. But uh, on Dex Q, as it formed outside a, a booth, it, you know, only amplified the sort of sense of anticipation and the, the sort of um, absolutely uh, you know, overwhelming desire on, on people's behalf to, to buy and acquire and, and sort of get involved in this madness, the frenzy that was happening at this art fair. And people would, of course, literally join the queue thinking, you know, well, what's in this booth? There must be something that, <laughs> that's worth uh, getting in line for. The queue also formed, you know, outside the VIP lounge and things like that as well. It worked incredibly well, the art fair. Um, other locations, anyway, one can imagine it'll raise various other issues depending on it, its context. Um, and it has an, an almost chameleon-like ability to uh, address the environment in which it's displayed. It's actually now part of the collection at Tate Modern and um, in the, this sort of massively populous destination now, um, which is no stranger to lines itself, there are queues all over Tate Modern. It, it can, of course, appear as a critical appraisal of the entertainment-driven popularity of such mega museums. In fact, we, we showed the queue, uh, I think it was about a month ago or something, and uh, it became a sort of absolutely hilarious episode in, in uh, it's a curatorial activity and we, we vaguely knew the people who were in the queue. I remember seeing them at the beginning of the day but they were swapping and changing over. And so then when, and they, they sort of had their own, um, their own plan, their own choreography for where they were going to start and stop and so on. There's usually one of the, the people in the queue who takes control of it to a certain extent. But uh, of course we were then looking for the queue. People say, oh, where's the queue? Where's the queue? And there were queues all over the building. <laughs> Is that the queue? Is that the real queue? Is that on next queue? Is it? And nobody knew by the end. We were just, you know, Maybe it's the queue on the fifth floor. <laughs> no, no, I think that's just a queue. <laughs> so, it's, I mean, it was an incredibly appropriate piece for, for Tate Modern. Um, 
so the, the work that I will talk about that's here, um, I actually don't have an image of, so we can keep this up, but uh, it's The Stray Man, which is the, the piece that you saw behind me. I hope all of you saw this as you came in. But um, The Stray Man's from 2006, and it, it similarly acts as a provocative enabler of readings, um, of sight to its various realizations. For its first performance in Graz, which is what you were seeing there in the video, a man was asked to come near the gallery in which Ondek had been asked to exhibit and wander close to its windows, situated adjacent to the street. From time to time, he gazed into the window, um, into the gallery, but he never entered. The performance was repeated every day for half an hour. Like many of Ondek's works, this was a piece that deliberately disappeared into its environment, much in the same way that the, the cue of, of uh, good feelings and good times engendered real confusion among those who saw it some joining it to wait for whatever appeared to be of such great promise. Once observed, however, the stray man sets in place a process of self-conscious realization that unravels the structure of the gallery or institution and more generally addresses the dynamics of the gaze. Seeing oneself being seen by an obvious outsider, the, the person looking in, the, the, the stray man, curious as to what is going on but unwilling to participate, the gallery visitor is made immediately aware of the otherness of his or her activity. Yet the work does not suggest the simple notion of us and them, the, the people inside and this man looking in, um, especially given that the man selected to act the part has a dignity that dispels any assumption of eccentricity. He doesn't look like a vagrant or a, you know, he's quite carefully chosen this, this character who plays the stray man whenever it's performed. Instead, it rotates the process of looking, the activity normally associated with those inside the space observing art, um, such that the viewer is now the one to be beheld. In other words, um, they're being looked at looking. So you're standing, the, the people who see this stray man walking by are, are suddenly made conscious of the fact that what they're doing in the gallery is looking, and they're being looked at looking. It's a sort of cycle of um, discomfort, actually. On next piece makes manifest the odd occupation of viewing art, but also the ocular fascination that is so much part of our culture and yet also the cause of such discomfort. When subsequently performed in Trento and London, the work was once more made evident the difference of, of these various sites. In Trento, um, it, it's a, Trento is a very small town, very small town, um, and the stray man had a, a, a very prominent presence because his behavior was so much out of the ordinary of, of, of how people were moving through the streets of Trento in, in the evening at this opening and afterwards. Um, so odd, in fact, that he actually appeared in the newspaper. <laughs> he was reported on the newspaper the next day. <laughs> Who's this man? Uh, whereas in London, when uh, The Stray Man was performed at, a, at an opening at a gallery, um, it had quite a different effect in that it, it kind of formed a, or, or served to exaggerate the the sense of uh, the spectacle of, of what was happening in the gallery, that it was a you know, fairly um, well-to-do gallery and the event itself became much more of a spectacle in a sense through this process of being looked at from outside. Um, the ability of uh, Ondek's work to make sight evident is particularly apparent when a work is seen in multiple locations, as, as the stray man has been, when it's realized in, in multiple different places, and one, uh, or good feelings in good times, the cue. But once you see it in different places, you begin to understand exactly how it, it functions. Um, and it will all turn out right in the end, which was the, the project that I worked on with uh, Roman Ondek at Tate Modern, uh, which was first made for the, the contemporary gallery there, is a scaled down, uh, it's reduced from 36 meters high to 3.6 meters high um, of this now world famous exhibition hall, the, the Turbine Hall. Um, Ondek constructed the model such that it occupied the entire exhibition space at Tate Modern. It's a small gallery, and so it, it really literally filled the whole gallery such that you couldn't see the, um, the sort of extraneous parts of the, the space. Um, as you cross the, the raised threshold into the gallery, it led you immediately into the ramped floor of the gallery. So what you see here is the, the sort of banister that led you in up, up the raised platform, and then where the, the slightly different color gray flooring begins is the, the ramped floor of Tate Modern's Turbine Hall. Um, oh. Perfectly constructed, which it was, um, down to the, the smallest detail, the handrails, the light effects, the uneven brick surface on the walls. He, he, really mimicked every minute detail so that you had a, a, a really strong sense of the lighting effects which are quite particular in that space and 
um, the, the sort of difference in um, the, the steel used for the girders as opposed to the, the metal handrail and so forth. Uh, the model uncannily reversed the physical, physically diminishing experience of entering Tate Modern spaces. Entering the model space, the audience experienced something akin to Alice in Wonderland in the White Rabbit's house, head and arms threatening to burst out of the windows, and no conceivable ability to squeeze over the bridge to the far end of the space. So when you walked into the model, um, by the time you reached the bridge, it was at, at sort of shin height or just below your knee. You, you couldn't have kind of bridged it to the other end. It was very, I realize I should have an image here with somebody standing in there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> now you can see. Um, beyond the immediately startling physical impression were layered pronunciations on the museum, the entertainment industry, our relationship to scale and its inherent suggestion of power, and the question of the hierarchy attached to artistically occupying the space of the turbine hall. Who gets to show there? Probably not a Slovakian artist. Um, Ondek's gesture, to some extent, literally demystified the turbine hall by bringing it down to size, while at the same time acted as a commentary on the potential activity of the rest of the museum, dominated as it is by this space and its fame. Ondek seemed to say almost as, uh, that, you know, if most people come to Tate to see the turbine hall, then why not simply give them what they want in every space of the museum? We'll have mini turbine halls all, all over Tate Modern, then everyone will be happy. As with Ondek's other works, there was also the possibility that the work would not be seen as an artwork at all. Um, the model was situated in a very infrequently visited contemporary gallery at Cape Tate Modern called Level 2 Gallery, um, which in fact, to see it, you actually have to exit the main part of the museum and enter a, a sort of space outside of the, the building. Um, and for many, it was the first time they had encountered this relatively hidden space. Maybe, the work seemed to suggest, this model of the turbine hall had in fact always been in place, a remnant of the persuasive argument put forward in the proposal by the architects Herzog de Neuron that was retained as part of the history of the museum's creation. And there were many people who I could see utterly perplexed about what this was and you know, how it came to be there. Um, later, the work was presented at CAC in Brittany. It's a contemporary gallery in a, a quiet suburb of Paris and the model was totally transformed. Um, it took out, sorry, a little. It was viewable from all sides, as you, you can see here. You could see the exterior, whereas at, at Tate Modern, you, you just walked into the space. Now, suddenly, you could see it as a, a, a box, really, like a giant doll's house, a sort of massive freestanding doll's house. Um, the witty placement of the world's most famous contemporary art space, the Turbine Hall, inside that of one of its least known associates, suggested a sharp curatorial irony. But of course, the touring turbine hall brought into ever more precise focus the overdetermined nature of the space and the warning it may carry to others. One can only imagine the hilarity and impacts poignancy of seeing the turbine hall at the Guggenheim in New York, or the turbine hall at the Pompidou Center in Paris, or even perhaps for sale at the Basel Art Fair. I always like the idea that the, the joke of the Texan who, who thought that he bought the Eiffel Tower, that somebody might think that they had bought the Tower <coughs> Hall as they acquired this piece by Roman Ondek. Um, installed at Tate Modern, the model attracted the same desire among visitors to be photographed against um, this, the, the bridge. Of course, instead of standing on top of the bridge, they were standing in front of it. And uh, in Roman's model, it, these were illicit images because you're not supposed to take photographs in any other space apart from the turbine hall, actually, where you can take photographs, but in any of the other art spaces, you're not allowed to take photographs. But people did, and I saw quite a few of them. Um, and the idea is now that, that these sort of images can enter circulation and cause exactly the same confusion as I was suggesting at the beginning of this talk, that uh, perhaps Ondak himself has uh, suggested that he uh, sort of experiences in his own work through this very literal reading of, of imagery, um, which may perhaps have been his, his sort of art education through reading art magazine images as opposed to uh, knowing the full story. Um, what you see is not necessarily what you think you see with Ondak's work, and what looks alike is inevitably not alike at all. Um, as with the interpretation of sites and monuments drawn by those who had never seen them for Ondek's common trip, it is precisely the divergence between these representations, parallel worlds of understanding or interpretation, that are the most revealing. I'm going to stop talking here, but um, maybe we can talk a bit about the works in the exhibition. <laughs>